You see, this is actually a highly marginal uh, area here. We're about 600 feet above sea level, and the downs go on up uh, to about 800 feet uh, on the Marlborough Downs. What do you mean by marginal? Uh, it's, it's an area which doesn't naturally lend itself to productive and efficient farming. Uh, particularly if the climate is a little worse than it is now. I have to make that qualification because, because all the Marlborough Downs are covered by field systems and settlements of the prehistoric and Roman period, so presumably it wasn't marginal then. So what you're saying is if they had a, a, a windy season or several windy seasons, several wet seasons, it may be enough to put them out of business farming up here. Yes, yes, I, that, that's precisely it. C can, you, can you just give us our bearings a little clearer and explain where we are in relation to, say, the medieval church and the medieval village, assuming there is one as well as this single farm? Yes, well obviously the tenurial pattern here is, is absolutely crucial to understanding why the site is here. Uh, Fifield Parish, within which we are, is one of these very long, thin parishes which are so characteristic of the chalklands uh, right across southern England. And we're getting fairly close to the northern tip of that long, thin parish which goes away to the south from us here, across the good farming land, which is still arable, down into the uh, Kennet Valley, where you had the water meadows, where the church still is, and it climbs up again on the other side, across what is still arable, and then into Savernac Forest, so that the, the parish in this long, thin strip did actually cover a great range of resources which were needed for the medieval farming community. And presumably it was difficult for the person living in this farm to be much further away from everybody else in the yes, parish. Yes, uh, it, it was, and indeed it was recognised at the time that this was was an unusual settlement. Can you say what happened over the years? Yes, I think, uh, I like to think with a, a fair degree of pre precision. Uh, we know the name of the person who was living here. He was called Richard. Uh, he was uh, given very special terms on which to uh, have this holding up here on the Downs because it was so far uh, from the village and, and very specifically so far from the manorial mill. Uh, he was allowed to grind his own corn up here and it's rather interesting that last century when Sir Richard Cold Hall, the great uh, archaeologist in Wiltshire, uh, who was the first one to find this site and subsequently was lost, he, he did a little diggings here and actually found a quernstone, a millstone, and I like to think that was the millstone of Richard of Radden. He had certain obligations for living up here. He had to provide so many eggs at Easter to the Lord. Uh, he was responsible for looking after the plough team uh, of the, uh, that was used for ploughing the strips in the extra open field, which was opened up on the downs here uh, in the 12th century. Now, that, in other words, it seems to me that probably there was a fourth field. I know there were three fields in Fifield. There was a fourth field added up here, really at the high tide of the expansion of the medieval settlement pattern round about 1250, something like that. Pretty isolated, really, isn't it? Yes, and uh, I think this is really the reason why, after a relatively short life, uh, the settlement was abandoned. The tide of uh, economic prosperity of the 12th and 13th century just receded a little bit, and this must have been one of the first settlements to be deserted. Uh, as that recession began to take place in the early 14th century. And I do stress this because uh, here documents and archaeology go together. This site was abandoned by 1320 at latest. It's a whole generation before the Black Death. The recession had already started. The Black Death merely exaggerated it. People who live in Oxford and Maidenhead and Henley will be familiar with the little village of Newnham Courtney, which you pass through on the A423 Henley to Oxford Road. On both sides of the road are some little 18th century brick and timber cottages. They look a bit like labourers' cottages, Mick. Yes, the, 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 that in fact is the present uh, village of Newnham Courtney, uh, but it's only been there since uh, the middle of the 18th century. Uh, now, uh, next to this village, there is the, the Newnham Courtney Park, which um, is private property at the moment and not uh, accessible to the public. And we've come down there now and we're standing outside not only a notice which says private no entry but uh, a lovely big stately home. Yes, this, this in fact is, is, is the house at Newnham Courtney, the, the large 18th century mansion, uh, one of a very large number that we get uh, all over the country. And it was the creation of the, this large 18th century estate with the house that um, involved the removal of the village. Uh, many people will be aware of the impact of imparking in their own areas, the, the creation of parks of one sort or another, uh, which resulted in either the moving or the shifting of, of a village. So there was a village where we're standing now? That's right, and we can be quite precise as to the date it w disappeared, because uh, Mrs Mavis Beatty has done a great deal of research into the village, 
uh, and we know that it was uh, deserted or depopulated by uh, Lord Harcourt in 1760 and 1761. Uh, he was anxious to create a park around his house uh, and not only did he gradually remove the village, pull it down and uh, rebuild the houses on the main road, which are the ones we can still see, but he also took down the medieval church which was uh, collapsing and rebuilt it as a Greek temple so that um, <laughs> You know, it was a sort of pagan building for Christian worship, and it was it was meant as a, a folly or a, a high point of his park, and uh, was not particularly convenient to the villagers who lived right on the edge of the park. D didn't they complain at being moved like this? We have very few references to anybody complaining, but uh, at Newnham Courtney we do have a reference to a certain uh, Babs Wyatt, a little old lady who was living in a clay-built cot, uh, in the middle of the village site, uh, who in fact uh, requested that she would be allowed to stay uh, until uh, she died because her husband had lived in the village all his life uh, and she wanted to remain where they'd always lived. And her wish was respected, she was treated as a sort of curiosity. So her little cottage would have been in the middle of parkland? Uh, yes, with new trees planted and uh, perhaps just the remains of buildings would have been detectable, although as we've seen on this site, the the village site is not at all prominent like it's been on the others we've visited uh, and it was obviously cl you know, clear, the land was levelled out very, very thoroughly. Uh, but it's a very widespread uh, phenomenon, this business of, of moving or, or even just um, relocating a, a village uh, in order to enlarge a park. It's, uh, there must be hundreds of examples all over the country uh, and some of our largest and uh, most obvious stately homes such as Castle Howard or Audley End and so on are, are the result of clearing land in order to put, to put up a large house with its park. In other words, one man in authority wanting some beautiful landscape around And it. having the power to, to move everybody out and create his own uh, particular environment. So far, we've seen how the change in land use from arable to pasture, how poor land and the ravages of bad weather, and how the creation of parkland by the Lord of the Manor have all contributed to the depopulation of villages. Indeed, the ones we've seen have all been abandoned and buried. But this wasn't the fate of them all. Many medieval villages survived. And to end the programme, we've come to Burton Dasset Hill Park in Warwickshire. We're not very far from Worm Leighton, where we were earlier. This is a public park and as the name suggests, is on a hill. We're about 100 to 150 feet up, and standing right on the edge of it now. Looking northwest, and very impressive it is too, spread out beneath us, as far as the eye can see, is the flat landscape of the Midlands. And we joined up again with Peter Fowler and James Bond. Now, Burton Dasset itself was a medieval market town, but, as James will bear out, it's surrounded by several villages. Yes, uh, within the medieval parish there were five separate settlements um, and one of these was promoted in the 13th century by market charter um, and was established as a market town. Um, we know that uh, there was more to it than just the charter. It did uh, actually operate as a market town because we have uh, references in medieval deeds to the marketplace in the, uh, in the town. What about the villages? The villages within the parish have met with several different fates. Um, in some cases, they're still very much with us. North End, uh, below, the, below us uh, here, uh, still exists as quite a large village. Um, others have disappeared completely. Um, South End has gone altogether. Uh, Burton, the settlement up by the parish church, half a mile away, has gone. And in other cases, uh, uh, Nightcote, one of the other hamlets in the parish, uh, is still there, but it's shrunk within its medieval bounds. We're beginning to see this as a, as a generality now, that uh, in any particular area we have settlements which have survived from the medieval period, uh, some which have been completely deserted, such as we've seen, uh, and a whole range between of places that are partially shrunk, almost disappeared, uh, and we get uh, similar developments with settlements changing their site, as we, as we saw at uh, Newnham Courtney. And I think the, the great lesson from looking at these deserted villages uh, is that we've begun to see that, that settlement is continually on the move. It's moving around its parish. Uh, various parts of an area are growing, various parts are declining. Uh, and we no longer must see settlements as static.
I'm sure this is the way to look at the medieval landscape, but I wouldn't like people to go away with the idea that this was a particularly medieval phenomenon, because taking a broader view, of course, archaeology has very largely existed on the study of deserted settlements, because this is something which has happened right from the beginning of time, uh, from uh, you know the, the, the classical cities, Roman cities, through to medieval town like this one below us, which is now just a, a grass field. And the same has happened at the... Uh, peasant or subsistence level or whatever you like to call it, that villages, settlements, farms have been coming and going the whole time. Uh, so we see this, you know, right through prehistory pre and indeed up to the present day. But what, what dictates this contraction and expansion? Uh, well, as we've seen in a number of cases, uh, 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 to a large measure it depends on the person who, who owns the land, the, the, the lord of the manor or the whatever p power it be. And I think we, we can We've seen again and again the impact that one man's or one person's decision can have on the livelihood uh, of a settlement. Uh, in, in the case where we are now, the actual uh, disappearance or the, or the finishing off of a town uh, was, I think I'm right in saying, James, the result of one man's action. Yes, in the case of Burton Dasset, uh, we have both the Lord of the Manor involved in the first raising of the place to a market town by taking out a market charter, um, and after the market town has gone into, into decline, we have a later Lord of the Manor, Sir Edward Belknap, um, directly involved in the final destruction of what was, what was already a declining community. If we can bring this up to date, I think we can see something similar happening today in, in the villages which we still have in the landscape. Um, at, at least two of us in this group are, are have or do work with planning departments and one is beginning to see after the, a number of years of the planning acts being applied to settlements um, uh, different effects on different villages. Uh, one can instance for example the, uh, the village with a conservation area with lots of listed buildings which is being um, mothballed from development um, and which uh, has higher house values, which means retired people, wealthy people are moving in, no development is allowed. And this can be contrasted with, if you like, the more run-of-the-mill village, uh, which um, may not be particularly attractive, which, uh, where new estates are allowed, where new skill schools have to be built, new shops and so on, and where the, the young couples and the commuters uh, are based that work in the nearby towns. And we're seeing a separation out uh, in, in different types of villages, which is very much the result, as with early examples, of decisions taken by uh, a lord or a lordly power, if you can call it, even if it's uh, in terms of the planning department. Yes, I'm sure this is true. But on the other hand, equally, I'm sure that you can't explain it all in terms of individual decisions. Uh, I think if one takes the broader view, you've got to start thinking in terms of trends, you know, economic depression over a, a century or something like that, or climatic change over a matter of two or three centuries. I mean, that, that case we had on Fifield Down, uh, there was a case where that was part of a general economic trend. I don't think there was any one particular person who said that settlement should stop. And the other point I'd like to make is that uh, since we've been emphasizing the desertion of settlements, don't forget that all the time that desertion is happening, new settlements are being founded. And again, that example on Fifield Down is one, and this example just in front of us here is another one. But what about later on in history? Well, of course, uh, coming into the post-medieval period, there's an enormous development of rural industries, for example, and these give rise to their own settlement pattern of villages and hamlets. Where I live, actually, is a very good example. Uh, it was a settlement uh, which was planned and plonked down in 1792 on top of medieval ridge and furrow of the open fields of my village, and this was quite specifically connected with the development of the mining industry, the, the growth, uh, the formation of companies to sink de deeper shafts. So th there's a very good example of a new settlement suddenly appearing in 1792 like that. And indeed we've got another example in front of us where if we look uh, beyond the field containing the earthworks of the deserted town of Burton Dasset, we can see a, a village of new houses springing up uh, two fields away. And you see, I think this is the general point. The emphasis uh, we've been talking about is of the desertion of settlements. I think at the same time we've got to remember that lots of new settlements for all sorts of new reasons are springing up at the same time.